Jesus knows my every word and deed. Jesus longs to meet my deepest needs. He lives now to intercede. He will surely stand by me. My God is a righteous God. My God is a holy God. My God is a faithful God. He will surely stand by me. Jesus' love has drawn my heart to him. Jesus' blood has washed away my sin. His word makes me pure within. He will surely stand by me. My God is a righteous God. My God is a holy God. My God is a faithful God. He will surely stand by me. My God is a righteous God. My God is a holy God. My God is a faithful God. He will surely stand by me. My God is a righteous God. My God is a holy God. My God is a faithful God. He will surely stand by me. He'll stand by me. He'll stand by me. Children may go to their Bible time now, if you like, and we'll bow together in prayer. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for your grace, your mercies, for your faithfulness to us. Thank you for the word of God. We thank you that you are a holy God. We live in a sinful world, so surrounded by wickedness we get used to it, and don't realize the appalling offense that every sin is to a holy God. Teach us from your word this morning, Lord, that we might understand that. We pray for those that are laid aside with illness, watch over them. We pray for in the, our country in these days of decision that you will guide men's hearts that they might, uh, by your grace, put in office of people who would uh, follow the paths of righteousness. We pray that you might uh, teach us now from the word of God and we give you thanks in Christ's name, amen. Take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 10. <clears throat> Hebrews, the 10th chapter. In chapter 10, give your attention to verses 26 through 31. <clears throat> the apostle says, For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that disposed Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy, who also hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenants wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. We want to consider that text this morning. Would you go back and look at the theme of it in verse 26? He says, for if we sin willfully, 
Skip down. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment. If we sin willfully, no sacrifice, but looking for judgment. Now a question rises. Who is the apostle talking to, or who is he talking about? And there's several possibilities. Uh, is he talking to a backslider, someone who's a believer and they're kind of falling back into their sins? Or is he talking about an apostate who was uh, a believer in Christ and then he turned his back on everything and abandoned his faith and uh, went back into apostasy and slid back into an unsaved condition? Or is he talking about true believers, those who know Christ as Savior? and perhaps fall into some sin. Well, uh, the commentators have a little problem with this passage, and uh, they think that this is talking about people who are apostate. Someone who is an apostate, that is, they believe, they put their faith in Christ, but then because of sins, they turn their back on Christ and slip back into an unsaved condition. Now, the better share commentators, because one you tends to follow another one, they say, yes, that's what it's talking about, but that really can't happen, because once you're saved, you're saved forever, so you can't slide back into an unsaved condition, but it's talking about that potential uh, uh, theoretical uh, situation where that could happen. Now, that's not right, because I notice that in this passage, it's very clear that he's talking to believers, those who've been born again into the family of God. Notice back in going back to verse, uh, uh, verse 19, he says, having therefore brethren, he's talking to fellow believers. And uh, notice the pronouns us or are or we, where the apostle is putting us together in that same group with him. Verse uh, tw uh, 22, let us draw near. Verse 23, let us hold fast. He talks in verse 22 about our bodies. And verse 24, let us consider one another. And uh, verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves, but exhorting one another. And verse 26, for if we, and it's plain, the apostle is talking about fellow believers who are in the household of God with him and warning them, believers, of the consequences of sin. Of course, there are consequences of sin to the unbeliever as well, but he's specifically warning believers of the consequences of sin. So that's us he is talking to. Now he's discussing this matter of willful sin, verse 26, if we sin willfully. Now what does that phrase mean? Well, in 1 Peter, we find the same word. It says, a uh, person taking the office of a bishop, he says, let him take it willf willingly. And in Psalm 54, the same word is used. When the psalm says, I will sacrifice, I will offer the sacrifices willingly. And so he's talking here about something you do because you want to. You do because you decide to. And many of our sins are that way. We know they're wrong, but we want to do them. And so we do them anyway. Now, all sins are not willing sins uh, in that sense. Uh, some sins fall into other categories. Some sins are just ignorance. Remember when Paul was in trial before the... Uh, uh, Sanhedrin, and uh, someone said uh, to the guard, smite him on the mouth. And Paul said, God will smite thee, you whited wall. You're commanding, uh, you're sitting to judge me by the law and commanding me to be smitten contrary to the law. And they said, oh, Paul, you can't say that. He's the high priest. Paul said, oh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. I didn't know he was the high priest because we're not supposed to speak evil against the ruler of our people. Well, he did it in ignorance. Some sins are like that. Some sins are sins of immaturity. Have a little toddler in your house and they upset their glass of milk. Well, that's not a big crime. Uh, they're too little to be coordinated enough and to know uh, you got to be careful so you don't upset the milk. That's just immaturity. And some sins are 
Uh, some, so, some sins are ignorance. Some sins are immaturity. Uh, some sins are just not thinking. Oh, I didn't realize. I didn't think about it. That kind of sins. Uh, they're all still sins. They're all wrong. But we're not talking about those in this passage. In this passage, he's talking about sins which are done knowingly and intentionally. So the subject is sin. You know, sin is always a bad thing in God's word. Back in the days of the flood, the world was destroyed because there was sin everywhere. Too much sin, and God was tired of it. And in the city of Sodom, God went down there and saw the uh, perversion, the moral wickedness of those people, and he destroyed the whole city because it was sin. And the uh, Bible talks about sin. But you know, you don't hear much about sin nowadays. Uh, I think there are you know, there more as much sin now as there was in the days of the flood, or in the days of Sodom. Listen, there's a whole lot more of it now. How do I know that? Because there's... 10,000 times more people in the world. And so there's bound to be a whole lot more sin, and there certainly there is. There's much sin, uh, but we don't hear much about it. Have you heard any of the politicians making their speeches, running their ads? Have any of them talked about how sin is? Huh? No, you're not good. If someone would, some politician would come up and say, now, I'm against this because it's sin, why, they would laugh him out of the country because we don't talk about sin anymore. And uh, yet, uh, and people don't believe in sin. And so we have a kind of creative ways of getting around sin. Uh, sometimes we say, well, we'll hide it. Nobody will know. It's okay because nobody knows I'm doing this thing. Maybe some of you are in that condition. Uh, sometimes we rename sin. You know, uh, drugs, uh, it's substance abuse. That sounds better nowadays. And uh, uh, something you done well, it was a mistake or bad judgment. Well, we just give a prettier name to sin. It's, uh, it's sin just the same anyway. Uh, Sometimes we just ignore sins, you know. Oh, we have all these shootings down in the city, south side of the city. We've got to get rid of the guns. Well, that might be good, but guns aren't the problem. The problem is sin, not guns. Sin is the problem. And sometimes we just minimize sin. Well, that's just, yeah, I'd do that. But that's a little thing. It doesn't matter much. Nobody cares anyway. Or sometimes we say, well, everybody's doing it. You know, everybody does that. So it's okay for me to do it too. Well, sin is wrong. And still, sin is still alive and well. It's just sugar-coated and ignored. Uh, but there is sin in this world, and all sin is against God. You're not sinning about, uh, against other people. You're not sinning against the environment. You're sinning against God. It's him we sin against. And you see, when we doubt God's law, that's sin. When we act contrary to what the Bible says, that's sin. When we break God's commands, that's sin. When we displease a holy God, that is sin. And the world's problem today is not the government or the environment uh, or poverty. The problem in the world today is sin. And if we sin when we know better, that's willful sin. Now, what are the consequences? Well, there are consequences, you know. You never get by with sin. There are always consequences. And there are different kinds of consequences for sin, different results of sin, uh, a sin grieves God, for one thing. Every time we sin, it grieves the heart of a holy God. It hinders our fellowship with God. Remember when Adam sinned, what did he do? He ran away from God and was hiding in the bushes. Didn't want God to find him. His fellowship with God was broken. That happens when you sin. Sin interferes with our prayers. How do we expect God to bless us if we're living sinfully? And there's sin between us and God. And sin robs us of our blessings. How can God bless us when we're living in sin? Sin brings chastisement, problems, sickness, death. Now, don't, don't get confused and think that every time something bad happens, that's chastening from God. That's not true at all. But sometimes uh, those things are chastening from God. And uh, so that's the result of sin. And certainly for the unsaved person, the result of sin is an eternal hell, which is an awful thing to think of. 
So, uh, what if we do sin willfully? And often we do. Well, notice what the consequence is not. Go back to verse 26. If we sin willfully, after we've received the knowledge of truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. If you sin willfully, you don't have to offer a sacrifice for sins. In Old Testament times, when they sinned, they had to bring sacrifice. You do some, break God's law, you bring a lamb or an animal or a dove or some or something, the fruit of the field. Or something. You bring something to God and sacrifice it. Not fruit, but an animal they killed in the bloodshed. You bring a sacrifice because you've sinned. And that's a, a sacrifice. And every time they would commit one of those sins, they're supposed to go and bring that sacrifice over and over, thousands, thousands, tens of thousands of sacrifices over and over through all those thousands of years of Old Testament history. And then Christ came, and he offered one sacrifice for sins, one sacrifice, and then it was all over. Notice in the book of Hebrews there, turn a couple of pages, chapter 7, verse 27. The priest today needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own and then for the people's. For this he did once, Jesus Christ, when he offered up himself. He offered one sacrifice, that was the end. In Hebrews chapter 9, just over the next page, in chapter 9, verse 28. So Christ was once offered to the bearers of, bear the sins of many. And chapter 10, verse 12. For this man, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Well, Christ offered one sacrifice, and that was the end of it. Now, some folk who go to church and think they have a sacrifice of Christ every time they worship and have the Mass. They're sacrificing Christ but that's not according to the Bible. There is no more sacrifice for sin. And if we sin willfully, there's not another sacrifice for that either. No more sacrifices. But there is a consequence. Consequence, not go out for a sacrifice. No, go back to verse 26 again. There remaineth, if we sin willfully, verse 26, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but here is the consequence a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Now that sounds kind of bad. That sounds kind of serious. Now there's judgment. And uh, this is the judgment not saying someone's guilty. This is the word is used here is when they lock them up, when they inflict the punishment. That's the judgment. And it says... That's, there's judgment for those who willingly sin against God. Now, what is that judgment like? Well, look at verse 27. First of all, uh, there's a certain fearful looking for judgment. Uh, fearful looking. In other words, fear God. Verse 31. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And we ought to realize that when we sin. We're sinning against a God who gets angry about sin. Verse 27 again, there's a certain fearful looking and there is fiery indignation. Fiery indignation. That is, God's anger gets hot when we sin. And we used to use a phrase, I don't hear it much anymore, but we say somebody's really burned up about something. That means they were so angry they were getting hot. Well, that's a little bit the idea here. God is burned up. God is very hot about the sins which we willingly commit. And uh, then it says, this judgment from God, this dealing with sins, is it shall devour the adversaries. Now that's not us. We're not God's adversaries. That's the unsaved people. And this judgment of God against sins, uh, it uh, uh, ought to make us afraid of God's judgment. It ought to, we ought to realize it's fiery indignation and it's such that it will devour and the unsaved person, devour the adversaries. 
Now understand, it's like good parents with children. And parents love their children, uh, but sometimes children will behave. And then parents get angry. And when we get angry, we don't disown them, we don't destroy them, but we do chasten them. And we're not happy with them. And that's God's position when we sin. Uh, yes, he doesn't destroy us. If we're believers, he's not going to send us to hell. But he is going to deal with us. And we are going to experience uh, God's chastening. <clears throat> well, how can we be so sure of that? Well, he tells us. You can be sure this is going to happen because look at verse 28. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Under the law of Moses, if someone would uh, break the law, two or three witnesses attest to them, they could be put to death. Remember that man that was out gathering sticks on the Sabbath day? Now, that's not a big deal. Uh, gathering some sticks so he could cook some supper. And he wasn't supposed to be doing that on the Sabbath day. He was breaking God's law, and he was stoned to death. And uh, in the law of Old Testament, if someone was promoting some false god, uh, if he was one of the people of Israel promoting a false god, let's go worship that idol, he should be put to death. And the sin of adultery, in, under the law, they should be put to death. Death destroyed those. And uh, so he says here, look, uh, should we doubt that there's danger of experience God's wrath? Well, under Moses' law, they died under two or three witnesses. And then he goes on to say in verse 29, of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy? Uh, what about a believer nowadays? God's going to be certainly angry with him as well, and even more so. In other words, we deserve even worse then Moses gave people under the law. What have we done? Well, notice, he describes it this way. These willful sins, these sins that you know are wrong and you do them anyway. It says, he's trodden underfoot the Son of God. In olden days, if a, a king would conquer another king in war, he would take that king he defeated and he'd, they'd throw him down on the ground and he and his generals would come and put their foot on his neck just showing they were despising him because he had done this thing. Uh, he was trodden underfoot, you might say. And that's the way we treat Jesus Christ when we willfully sin. It's like we're just showing him contempt and despising him. And then it says, he is, verse 29, he has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing. Jesus shed his blood to pay for our sins. And we are going to despise his blood, go out and commit more sins. Oh, what an awful thing. And then he says, end of verse 29, he has done despite under the spirit of grace. Showed contempt for the Holy Spirit. If we are believers, the Holy Spirit dwells within us. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And we're despising the Holy Spirit, showing contempt for him. If we say, oh, we don't care what you think, how you feel, we're going to do this because we want to do it. We're going to do it because this is the best thing for me to do, commit this sin. Oh, what a tragedy. To, uh, it's against all the persons of the triune God. Uh, God's Son were trampling underfoot. The blood of the Son were despising. The Holy Spirit were showing despite for. And... We have those reasons not to sin. And you know, we have a lot of reasons to not sin that those Old Testament people didn't have. We have more scripture. They just had the Old Testament, not even all of that in the earlier days. And we have the whole complete revelation of God. Everything we need to know about sin is there. And so we're more accountable than they were. And we have the indwelling Holy Spirit. They didn't have that in Bible days, not in Old Testament times. The Holy Spirit would come upon them sometimes, but he didn't live within them. But the Holy Spirit today lives within us. Our body is his temple. And what a <clears throat> gross thing it is then for us to despise the Holy Spirit by our sins. And so God has warned us of the dangers of sin. Look at verse 30. 
We know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense. Vengeance, that is getting angry and dealing with something. And nobody else is going to deal with us about our sins, but God himself will. He has said, I will repay, I will deal with this thing. And then it goes on to say, the end of verse 30, the Lord shall judge his people. We're not talking about the unsaved here. God's people, God is going to judge them. Now that doesn't mean judge us to send us to hell, but it means judging us to bring, the, uh, bring chastening upon us and the chastening of the Lord. And then he says, it's a fearful thing, verse 33. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Well, does a Christian have to worry about sinning? He should. Not that God can't forgive it. Uh, but if we sin willfully, we ought to be concerned about God's unhappiness with us and how he's going to deal with us. And God loves us. But how he is grieved and upset when we willingly sin against him. And so we ought to, we ought to fear God. Psalm 34 says, Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints. For there's uh, you, God's people, fear him. Proverbs 29, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Well, how long has God been reproving you about something in your life? You don't change it. Go on. The Psalm 7, God judgeth the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked every day. If we are living with sin in our life and harboring it and not dealing with it, God's angry with us every day. How can we expect God to bless us and use us? In Hebrews 12, it says, Our God is a consuming fire. Listen, God hates sin. God's angry with the sinner. And we live many of our days under the wrath of a holy God. And then we wonder why he doesn't bless us and use us. Well, you see, sin is rebelling against God. Sin is breaking God's holy law. Sin deserves the death penalty. Sin is offensive to God in his holiness. Sin is harmful to us and those around us. And sin is what put Jesus Christ on the cross. That's how God sees sin. See, we don't get by with sin. Every sin has consequences. We think we can hide it. Nobody will know. So I worry about it. God sees and God knows. And God's grieved. You don't get by with willful sin. Adam sinned. He didn't get by with it. Lost his fellowship with God. Cain sinned. He didn't get by with it. God put a mark on him and he spent the rest of his days as a fugitive. Achan sinned. He was destroyed. Stoned to death. King Saul uh, sinned. and lost his kingdom. David didn't get by with sin. He lost his infant son. We never get by with sin. There's always consequences, big or small, whatever God ordains. But the scripture says, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. So let me apply this, first of all, to the believer. Oh, listen, you're a believer here. Don't be proud and confident and stubborn. Uh, no, yield to God. Admit Confess those sins. Deal with them. Get rid of them from your life. And for the backslider, this person, the believer who's continuing in some sin, Hebrews chapter 3 says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, well, it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. As long as you hang on to the sin, the harder it gets to get rid of it. And the backslider needs to realize he's slipping down further and further in his fellowship with God. And for the unsaved, for the unsaved, there are consequences for sin. Sin will drag you down to an eternal hell. We read that passage in Luke 16 of that rich man who went to hell and it says, In hell he lifted up his eyes being in torment and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I'm tormented in this flame. That's the lot of the unsaved person. And Romans 1.8 says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness 
and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Wrath of God revealed. And Revelation 6, we find a picture of those who resist God and reject him. And they say in that future time, they'll say to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? Oh God, a holy God is an awful person to face for the unsaved face lost eternity. Shall we bow in prayer? Father, thank you for your grace. Lord, that you provided forgiveness and salvation to all who will trust him. But Lord, help us to realize the danger <coughs> and the consequences of just neglecting to do right and sin in our lives. So pray that each one here, Lord, might be willing to be honest with their heart. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Take your hymnal, turn with me to number 120. 120. Oh, oh, wrong number somewhere. There's a wideness in God's mercy. Uh, where is it? Uh, One twenty eight, okay. One twenty eight, that's better. One hundred twenty eight. Stand together and sing. There's a wideness in God's mercy, like the wideness of the sea. There's a kindness in his justice Which is more than liberty There is welcome for the sinner And more graces for the good There is mercy with the Savior There is healing blood for the love of God is broader than the measure of man's mind and the heart of the eternal is most wonderfully kind if our love were but more simple we should take him at his word and our lives would be a sunshine in the sweetness of our lord would you just bow your heads as the instruments play and let me ask you now heads bowed and eyes closed but uh, what about sin in your life oh we're all sin every day but is there willful sin there Something you know is wrong, and you just keep on hardening your heart, continuing, making excuses for it. Isn't the time you dealt with that thing and asked God to take it out, forgive you, and take it out of your life? Isn't the time you face the reality that this is sin, and sin is going to harm your relationship with God and with others, harm your blessings, bring God's chastening upon you? Heads are bowed and eyes closed, but maybe have a need in your heart, doesn't matter if it's a big thing or a little thing, something you want to get right with God, heads are bowed here, just come and kneel here and tell God what it is, and deal with it. Say, I'm not going to go on anymore with this thing in my life. This temptation that gets the best of you, this sin which conquers you and overcomes you, enslaves you. Would you come, get that thing right in your life, whatever it might be? God will deal with it, God will forgive. He's willing to make it right with Him. Don't go on harboring that sin. Hang on to it. Others, would you come? Anyone? Heads bowed, come and deal with that thing in your life. Others? Maybe you're unsaved here this morning, facing the prospect of a lost eternity. If you'd lose your life, you'd drop into hell in a minute. You want to go on that way, running that risk? You want to see the Lord save you today? You can do that. Would you come? Any others?
Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you that you're God of mercy. Yet, Lord, we also realize that if we persist in our sins, you can be a consuming fire to bring chastening in our lives, to bring the lost sinner to an eternal hell. Lord, we pray that we might have soft hearts and yield to thee and be willing to deal with sin and get it out of our lives and walk with thee as we should. So bless each one, Lord. Others here tonight or today have needs in their lives as well, the sins they ought to be dealing with. Help them, convict them, Lord, and show them what it takes to just be honest with God and turn from sin and seek your forgiveness and walk with thee. So bless, Lord, we pray each one dismisses with your goodness upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.